Welcome back from lunch. I appreciate uh, you coming. This session is going to be a little bit different uh, than the ones you've been used to before. Uh, but before we start, I have been told to remind you again, under threat of death by me from L Lydia, uh, to fill out your feedback forms. Uh, it's critical that we get those as soon as you can. And if you fill them out as you go along, it'll speed the process up at the end. Uh, but uh, if you could uh, fill those out as you go along. Um, Again, this is, this is going to be a little bit different session. Uh, this is going to be a moderated discussion about clinical trials. Um, and my name is Bill Crowley. I'm with the MPN Research Foundation uh, in Chicago in the United States. Uh, and I'm a member of the steering committee for the MPN Global Network uh, that helps plan these events. And uh, I'm appreciating the uh, opportunity to conduct this, this, this discussion with the uh, panel that we put together. I want to give you a little bit of background of where we are and how we, where do I go? Ah, there we go. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and how we, how I developed this, this session. Uh, the thoughts about this uh, started last year after the Frankfurt uh, meeting. And at the end of these conferences, we sit down with the sponsors and talk about what their thoughts are and how they want to change uh, things or how they think uh, it, it could be better. And one of the things that they all said was that they would like to be more involved. Uh, previously, we had them all sitting in the audience. We didn't recognize them. We didn't really talk about them. They sat there and they weren't, they weren't, they weren't labeled. Nobody knew who exactly who they were. Uh, and we do want to get them more involved because they, they bring an interesting perspective uh, to, 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 the, to the conversation. Um, now, thinking about how to get them more involved, my thought process went to the one area that I think the patient community, the clinicians, the medical side, and the pharmaceutical side kind of intersect, and that's in clinical trials. Um, every uh, patient wants drugs uh, approved, more therapies, and the best way, the only way to go through that is through clinical trials. Uh, Clinicians, the medical side, they want, uh, as I said earlier, more arrows for their quiver. They want more opportunities, more things that they can give to patients to, to, uh, to, to help their condition. And while we use uh, a number of combination, a number of drugs that are off-label, we only have one drug that is approved, um, in, at least in the United States and in different parts. Uh, and the other group is obviously the pharmaceutical side that wants to get their compound to patients um, and what they've been developing to improve their condition. So, you know, we're going we're gonna to talk about um, those perspectives today, for lack of a better word. Um, but as we go along, um, we're going to talk about the clinical trial process uh, and those ideas or what they're, they're, those connections overlap in the different areas. Um, this, is, this is basically the agenda. It's not going to be very long, but um, the agenda itself, but the conversation will be. Um, every clinical study or trial is led by a principal investigator who's often a medical doctor. Uh, these clinical sty uh, studies have a research team that includes doctors, nurses, social workers, healthcare professionals in the, in the clinic. Uh, taking part in the discussion today, like I said, are some of the medical uh, speakers from the conference. Uh, today we're joined by three what we call key opinion leaders in MPNs. Uh, you'll recognize all of them, I think, uh, starting at the middle of the table is Ruben Mesa from uh, the University of Texas in San Antonio. Uh, next to him is Martin Ellis from the Mir Medical Center in Israel. And at the end of the table is Dr. Andrega uh, Bogdanovich from the University of Belgrade Clinic in Hematology in Serbia. They'll all bring a different perspective of clinical trials and how they operate from, from where they're geographically located. And it would be different. Uh, now, clinical studies or trials can be sponsored or funded uh, by pharmaceutical companies, academic medical centers, voluntary groups, other organizations. Um, most clinical trials in MPNs, and I'm thinking all of them, but I'm not sure if all of them are only sponsored by pharmaceutical industry at this point. I'm trying to think of an exception, but I can't off the top of my head. But uh, to look at the perspective of the pharmaceutical side, we've got some of our uh, sponsors up on stage, um, and they include 
Jim Fong, who's directly to my left here uh, from CTI Biopharma, they're developing the drug picritinib, uh, which is currently in a phase two, Correct. phase two clinical trial. Uh, Dave Dubinsky, next to Jim, is uh, from Insight. They uh, distribute and have the rights for ruxolitamine uh, within the United States. In addition, they're also conducting a number of clinical trials, uh, and recently they have an ET trial that's beginning. Yeah, yeah, Correct. beginning to enroll. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they're, they're comparing ruxolitamide with thydroxurea. Uh, and next to him is Alexi Salamaka from, I hope I got your name right, Alexi. Apologies if I didn't, but he's from Novartis. Uh, Novartis, as you know, has the rights and distrib distribution outside of the United States. Uh, now, they're also conducting a number of clinical uh, combination trials with ruxolitamide. Um, they're also co conducting another trial, at least one trial that I know of, the LCL 161, which is in a phase two trial. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, so there's, this is a new class of drug. It's not a JAK inhibitor. It's a SMAC inhibitor, SMAC. Um, and I'm not going to get into the mechanism of action because I'm not going to talk off the top of my head about that. But uh, uh, that's, that's where we're at. Um, full disclosure, um, nobody up here, uh, including myself, uh, is going to, is suggesting that anyone enroll in a clinical trial. That conversation is between you and your medical person. Um, it, uh, I'm gonna, what we're going to try to do is give you more in, information about a clinical trial, what it means for you and what your rights are and what your duties and responsibilities are if you decide to go into a clinical trial. And it's not just the patient, it's obviously the patient family decision also. Now, as you look at this, um, depending upon what you see depends on where you sit. So if you are a medical person, you might look at the pharmaceutical, the uh, drug development process one way. If you're from the pharmaceutical industry, you look at another, and a patient might look at it another. Looking at this picture, you might see one of two things, two silhouettes, sil silhouettes of two people staring at each other or a vase. It just depends on your perspective, and it has to be, you have to change it a little bit to figure out where those two are. Um, but that's the, that's the idea of this conversation. Um, and uh, most patients know about clinical trials from their perspective. Um, but I think it might be useful for the audience to understand the perspective of the pharmaceutical industry and the medical side, what they have to go through to conduct these trials. Kind of a, I'll use the, 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 the number 360 degree look at clinical trials um, about how they're planned, implemented, uh, and as I mentioned, on stage are representatives from the sponsors, the medical speakers uh, presenting this weekend, but there's a couple of voices not on the stage that are conspicuous by their absence. Uh, the biggest one is the regulatory side. We had hoped to get a representative from the regulatory side uh, to participate, well, we just couldn't get them for this conference. Uh, they didn't, they wanted to, but timing and uh, there was some uh, logistical uh, uh, problems, but uh, hopefully next year we'll get more of their perspective in it. The other voice that is missing from the panel is yours. Uh, there's no patients up on the stage here. Uh, that's kind of intentional, but actually not intentional. We just don't have enough room for many more people up here and you all can't come up here. But, uh, this is where you come in, and this is why this session is going to be a little bit different than what we've done in the past. Uh, as we go through the moderated discussion part of the presentation, uh, I'll be asking the panel specifically questions about clinical trials from their perspective, uh, and then I'll ask for your perspective and your thoughts on it. Um, and as we go along, uh, there'll be some questions that will only be pertinent to the folks on, on the panel, but there are other opportunities for you to ask questions uh, or to voice opinions and that sort of thing. Uh, the idea is that hopefully by the end of the trial, you'll have a better, a better idea of what um, is involved with a clinical trial and understanding the process a little bit. Um, I know that most of you um, understand what a clinical trial is. Uh, some of you may be in a clinical trial, um, but there are maybe people in the audience who are unsure of what the different phases include, unsure of what your duties, responsibilities, your uh, safeguards that you can put in. Um, 
and, and how you can participate in a, clini uh, in a clinical trial. Um, there may be, uh, with a clinical trial, there may be uh, a specific intervention according to a research plan or protocol that's created by investigators that's going to be in, uh, looked at. Uh, these may be medical products, uh, drugs, devices, uh, procedures, changes in uh, participants' behavior such as diet. These are all things that a clinical trial might look at. It doesn't necessarily have to be about a drug development. Clinical trials compare a new medical approach to a standard one, uh, one that is readily available, um, one that might not be readily available, or to a placebo in some cases, uh, where there, or to uh, a placebo is a, is a, is a uh, compound with no active ingredients. Uh, you don't know if you're taking a placebo, placebo or the drug that's being tested sometimes. Or sometimes they're compared to no intervention at all. Is this drug better than uh, watch and wait, or what is the, the standard therapy? Um, but because clinical trials, because of clinical trials, drugs like uh, ruxolitimid, uh, interferon that we were talking about earlier, um, those drugs are now widely used by MPN patients. We don't have a compound. Hydroxyurea went through clinical trials. Uh, this is the only mechanism in place to get drugs to the patients. And in the United States, uh, clinical trials are regulated by the FDA, uh, and they approve or uh, uh, new drugs and, and compounds. Um, and what we're going to be talking about are the five phases of a clinical trial. Um, and each phase is based on the uh, study's objective, the number of participants, the uh, other characteristics of the trial itself. This is uh, those phases. It starts with the discovery phase on the bottom, uh, which is sometimes also called uh, phase zero or early phase one. Uh, there's phase one, two, and three. After phase three, it goes to the regulatory commissions. Uh, and then there's also a uh, post-approval study that might go on. Uh, clinical trials last a specific period of time. Uh, studies after a drug has been approved uh, continue because they want to look at the drug over a longer period of time. So there's, there's those four or five stages that you want to talk about. Now, in phase zero or early phase one, uh, this is an exploratory trial before the traditional phase one trial that starts. Uh, they investigate how or whether a drug is effective in the body. Uh, they involve very limited human exposure, if at all. Sometimes there's are animal tests. Um, and they, they want to see if the drug has uh, therapeutic or diagnostic, meets therapeutic or diagnostic goals. After that phase, if that's successful, um, the next is the phase one clinical trial. Uh, this is uh, a, a dosage to see uh, how determined uh, the drug's most frequent and serious adverse effects are, uh, often how the drug is broken down within uh, people in the trial. And there's usually a very small number of participants in these trials. Uh, could be as low, as low as 10 or 15 people. But they want to be very careful. It's a more of a safety uh, concern here. Um, uh, phase two is uh, obviously a much larger group of individuals. Um, and this is uh, preliminary data is gathered on whether a drug works with people uh, who have a certain condition or disease. Uh, the, Preliminary data that's gathered uh, is to, to see exactly how these drugs are working after the phase one trial. Um, participants receiving the drug may be compared to similar participants receiving a different drug, um, normally the best available therapy, but not always. Sometimes they get an inactive substance, as I said, like a placebo, uh, or a different drug altogether. Um, and safety continues to be evaluated in short term adverse events are studied. The phase three trial is an even larger group of people, and this means that the first phase two trial met their uh, endpoints. Um, phase, phase three trial will gather more information about the drug safety and effectiveness by studying different populations, different dosages, by using the drug in combination with other trials, sometimes, 
Uh, these studies typically involve a lot more patients, up to two or three hundred sometimes, perhaps more, particularly if it's a large patient group. That's not something that we need to think about in, in, uh, in uh, MPNs. Now, stage four, again, is conducted after a drug has been approved uh, to see if the drug continues to be effective for how long, if there's other adverse uh, uh, effects that were not uh, seen in the, in the phase three trial. Uh, they want to make sure that this is not a short-term solution, by short-term three to five, six, ten years, something like that. Um, and there's, there might also be opportunities to, uh, to uh, look at the dosage for different populations. Um, and uh, now the true benefit, where's my thing, here we go. The true benefit of a drug is determined by randomization. Uh, this is when two or more alternative treatments are selected by chance, not choice, but by chance. If one treatment is found to be far superior than the other, the trial is stopped so all participants get the better treatment. You're not automatically going to always get the worst treatment, particularly if something looks like it's working well. Uh, the other one is a, a double or single blind study. This is when the participants, a single study, a, sting, a single blind study, only the patient is not told what's being given. Double blind study, the doctors don't know either. Only the pharmacists know which compound you might be getting. Um, and then there's the placebos, which we talked about before, uh, not uh, clinically responsive to, 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 the, to the compound. Um, and as we've all talked about before, there are risks. This is a science experiment, and you are the guinea pig, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, so you have to be sure that, uh, and, and the trials have to be set up in such a way that you are protected. But uh, there is some risk of harm. There's some injury involved sometimes. Um, it may not be greater than the risk involved with the routine medical care uh, that you're re receiving now, uh, or the disease progression that you're exposed to as it is. Uh, and like any test or treatment, there may be side effects that you don't experience now but would on the compound that's being uh, evaluated. Other downsides besides the physical part, uh, you may be required to uh, attend hospital visits more often. There's probably more paperwork that has to be filled out, more tests like uh, bone marrow biopsies or more uh, blood uh, CBCs. And there might be an extra cost involved, travel costs, uh, um, which would include not only transportation but uh, uh, lodging, uh, leaving work for more often, uh, that sort of thing. So you have to figure all of those things in. Now, as there are risks, there are things that are safeguarding you uh, from those risks as much as possible. Uh, these trials are approved by what's normally called an Institutional Review Board, or IRB. That board decides that the risks of participations have been as minimized as possible and are reasonable in relation to anticipated benefits. It's kind of a legalese kind of comp uh, comment. But the IRB is made up of doctors, researchers, and members of the community. Its role is to make sure that the study is ethical, that the rights and welfare of the patients are protected, and that some clinical studies are monitored by a data monitoring committee, also known as data safety monitoring boards. So there's a lot of people looking at the trials as they're going through. Patients don't see that because this is all behind the scenes. Another safeguard for you is informed consent. In general, a person conduct, uh, being in, in enrolled in a clinical trial uh, must sign an inform, informed consent document before the, joining the study to show that he or she's been given the information on the risks, potential benefits, and alternatives that he or she understands it. Then you sign the document, but it looks like a contract, but it's not you have the opportunity to leave the, 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 the trial if you feel that it is not in your best interest to continue. Um, it's not a contract that you're bound to. Uh, you're always able as a patient to walk away. And when you get into a trial, these are some of the questions that you might want to ask, just some of the questions. There's, there's a whole bunch that you may want to ask as you get into it. Uh, but know your rights, know your 
uh, what's happening with each of the phases and know uh, pretty much what, uh, what to expect as you go along. That's pretty much the clinical trials 101 part that I wanted to, to give before, just so that we all are on the same page as, as, as to what a clinical trial is all about. Now we'll start the moderated discussion part. Uh, and uh, again, the, we've got the pharmaceutical side, we've got the medical side, and the patients. Now some of the patients, um, some of the questions the patients, are, it, it wouldn't be pertinent for you to answer, but if you do have uh, a comment or a question as we go along, please raise your hand. Uh, we will include that. Some questions are, would be only aimed at either the medical side or the pharmaceutical side, but again, if, if a question is aimed at the pharmaceutical side and the medical side wants to weigh in on it, you're certainly more than welcome. But uh, I wanted to organize it that way just as to, to uh, get those, those, those questions. The first question, and uh, in my research, the number one reason the patients don't enroll in a trial is lack of awareness. Quite simply, they just don't know what clinical trials are. They don't understand the importance of them. Uh, they don't understand, uh, they, they don't know the trials are going on. Uh, for both sides, um, how do you work with patient advocacy groups like the groups in the audience to provide information about clinical trials so patients are better informed? Uh, we start down at the end there. Well, Bill, thank you for the introduction. Uh, the answer is uh, quite easy, but uh, there is a certain frightness of the patients uh, talking about uh, clinical trials, especially in countries when do not have uh, proper education, etc. And we must take care in uh, take care in account. Um, besides, the patients should feel uh, safe because all regulators. E even in Europe, e uh, European uh, agency and uh, FDA in Japan, Japan agency, have the very strict rules for that. And uh, those clinical trials are not done without internationally recognized Euro rules. And that's one of the main issues of the clinical trials. Uh, in the last 10 to 15 years, I'm dealing with the clinical trials in uh, Serbia, small country in the Balkans, but uh, Good, with, good, with still good medicine, we have faced uh, several uh, problems with patients uh, acting with clinical trials. There are very uh, explosive uh, uh, advertisements and very explosive uh, newspaper reels uh, in some tabloid magazines that some patient has a side effect or the clinical trial is conducted without proper, proper thing. Uh, I think that uh, it's not true uh, to a certain extent, but also the doctors should talk with the, their patients. We are all assessed by the pharma industry or by sponsors or by our colleagues in, inter, in, in international trials, investigative in, interventional trials, and we all know who are the, our patients. We know the patients in you know, one hospital. Maybe it's a different in states because the practice of medicine in states completely differs from that uh, in Europe. Mm -hmm. But in many countries in Europe, you have uh, strong centers, mainly academic one, leading the clinical, the clinical trials. Most of us leading uh, clinical trials are also involved in uh, teaching. Uh, we have uh, additional ethical, uh, let's say, uh, obligations toward the community. So we are very uh, open to uh, explain to patients in the uh, uh, phase of preparation of trial before any paperwork before any uh, approval, uh, we should uh, be very aware how many patients we have and very, very, very much, uh, and that feasibility is much, uh, much known to doctors than to any patient. In the case when we have open trial, we are directing to our colleagues. We said we have a trial in such a drug. I have leaded two or three trials in CML. So we have approached to other doctors in different centers, uh, explaining them that we have. But their obligation is to say to patients that the, the, the patients have a possibility to enter into trial. Uh, sometimes it's uh, unfortunately error on the other side that some centers will not send the patients. It's very easy when you have a, a new drug, when you can, do not have any treatment. Uh, all trials in CML with imatinib were extremely powerful because they have a very fast recruitment because there is no uh, special treatment or there is a completely different treatment. So those trials, one of the trials uh, I'm participating in, NSPAT in CML, was completely recruitment of 1,000 patients within one year mm -hmm. within Europe. That's, that's a large bark of patients, and they are mainly selected. So 
the patient advocacy group should provide information to uh, patients, to patients particularly who are afraid uh, to take a part of it. I don't like to be a guinea pig. It's one of a uh, uh, common saying, or I don't like to, to have to, to, uh, to receive something I do not know. Right. Placebo trials are very rare in hematology. Probably it's absent in hematology. Even the trials with blind, blinding is uh, almost absent in hematology because it's, uh, it's malignant diseases. Mm -hmm. Most of our trials are best, best available treatment. So we have the comparison patients are treated so they do not have that impression right. they are not, not treated. And that's one of the, the fears we should uh, dismiss in the beginning. Patient organizations uh, like advocacy uh, in Serbia, let's say, but uh, also with CML network, because I'm, I'm much more known in CML community, uh, are addressing to, pati to patients uh, possibility that we have a trial, but not all patients are uh, eligible for the trials. Right. We are approaching patients uh, one by one by looking at their files to see are they uh, candidates for the trials, providing uh, initial information uh, that is not information uh, like in written consent. Mm -hmm. But that, that communication makes some kind of a doctor-patient relationship. And if a doctor is a good doctor with a good uh, communication skills, mm -hmm. he can explain to patient, but also we leave the patient that he may ask someone else before signing informed consent about, about that. And especially in smaller countries like Serbia, when we have a few treatments, that's the only option for some patients to get some treatment. Yeah. I think that uh, in some countries, like in States, it's a little bit different because of their insurance, but I think that uh, Israel have the same, same situation. Is that about right, doctor? Yeah, I think that's uh, pretty much the same. Yeah, anything to add, Ruben? I think that was a, a, an excellent explanation. I, I, think, I think the point that you were raising is really both awareness and I think also the issue that was raised in terms of patients having a preconceived notion around clinical trials. Mm -hmm. You know, certainly it is, this is something that I've been involved with different groups that have thought of, you know, how do we have trials that have a representative set of the population so that we can learn the best from that trial. You know, I think that, that baseline awareness, you know, that clinical trials are a key part of the options that we have when we treat disease, mm -hmm. right? in particular in difficult diseases. And uh, there are many layers to that. One key one is the breadth of clinical trials. And I think you, your, your summary summed that up well, uh, but in that part, even as it relates to drug therapies, clinical trials really truly range from being incredibly experimental. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the first time we will try this drug in a human being, mm -hmm. and there is a lot of uncertainty with that, to trials that have uh, very little unexpected uh, impact, that uh, we have much more confidence, mm -hmm. you know, a slight change in the dose of a medication right. that's already well known, uh, perhaps a combination of two drugs that are already very well described. So I do try to share with my patients a bit of that spectrum, you know, how uncertain is the trial itself. Some are incredibly experimental, some it's much more subtle. Yeah. Uh, Alexei? Um, what I would like to focus on is the part of working with and collaborating with patient advocacy organizations when it comes to clinical trials, right? And um, there are different kind of approaches and perceptions there. And um, a lot, what I hear from our medical colleagues um, at Novartis is when the trial is up and running, uh, they come running saying, well, we need to share the information about the sites, about the trial with our patient advocacy partners so the patients are informed, right? So this is a knee-jerk reaction. And I always say, well, hold on, uh, let's think it through because just sharing the information about the trials is not enough. And it's actually um, complicated because think about it. You receive the information about clinical trials, uh, some brief description because we have 
tons of regulations that we have to abide by before sending this information over to you. And then what do you do with it? Okay, the patients get it, and then what? Where do they call? Where do they go? So these are all the things that need to be thought through if there is a phone number, is there is a phone number of the sites and the investigators? Are they available to have a conversation with someone who called them? Do they have staff in order to fulfill those requests, etc.? But that's only a part of the problem because my belief is that when we have the trials open and up and running, it's already too late to, to actually work with patient advocacy organizations because it, it is what it is. It's, well, there is a possibility to change it, but it's, it's, it's a massive process and it takes a very long time. So usually we have what we have and we have to work with it, right? So I believe that there are much greater opportunities to work with patient advocacy organizations before the trials open. And we talked about that earlier um, today and yesterday when we develop the protocol synopsis documents, when we design those protocols, there are some key moments when we need to focus on together, such as visitation schedules or tests, et cetera, et cetera, to make sure that the trials are in fact written in a patient-friendly manner. So when the patients receive the information through various channels, through patient advocacy partners, directly through the investigators, or any other routes, they can actually participate and not drop out after two or three weeks or two or three months of participating in the trial. Yeah, we're going to be talking about those kind of things later on too. But there is, there is an opportunity for patients to get involved earlier than before when they start to enroll mm -hmm. the trial. At least there should be, but yeah. Okay. D Dave? Sure. Um, I, would, I would just add uh, one thing, pharmaceutical companies are required to list all of their clinical trials on clinicaltrials.org, mm -hmm. at least in the United States. Um, so, sure. Uh, we, we, pharmaceutical companies, we are required to um, list all of our <coughs> clinical trials on clinicaltrials.org on a website dot in the go. United States. Or dot, dot, go. dot go, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, but, you know, back to the conversation, I think at least in, in the United States, one of the big differences or challenges are that most studies are done in more of an academic setting versus a community clinic type of treating mm -hmm. um, where physicians are. So I, I believe and what I've seen is if a patient is going to an academic center, clinical trials are often offered as a one of the options for the patients. But we see that in the community setting that always doesn't take place. So I think that's where the advocacy organizations can come and help. And you know, to, um, to the point earlier, it is good to work with them earlier. But when a trial is going on, what we try to do is one, make sure that the organizations are aware of what the trials are. And just a little bit of basics around the inclusion and exclusion criteria so that if patients are calling the call center for an advocacy organization or they run into a patient who's inquiring about it, at least they can provide an educated um, guidance um, so that that patient can talk to their doctor and not, if they aren't going to be qualified, and not waste their time with that as well. Um, we also um, like to get feedback um, from the patient organizations because we feel that they do represent the broader um, patient community. Um, so not only when we're designing the protocols or the informed consent, um, but also on patient-friendly materials. One of the things that we do at Insight is we um, create a patient-friendly brochure for each of our trials. So that's just you know two pages that just talks about what a trial is. It, it leads to resources that already exist, explaining similar to what you did with your slides on what is involved in being in a trial, and then questions to discuss with your doctor. Um, Jim, did you want to add anything? Yeah. In addition to what was already covered by my esteemed colleagues here, you know, the other thing that we've leveraged uh, the advocacy groups for, um, as, as Dr. Mesa and the other physicians have mentioned, is just, you know, we've done videotapes and interviews with physicians who are involved in the trial and have those uploaded onto the different advocacy sites. And those interviews are very helpful because the PI themselves will describe on the videotape you know, the trial and the experimental compound and, and help provide better education about this experimental therapy. So it, it's a great resource to, again, reassure family members and patients that they're not just being a, a guinea pig with this 
kind of newfangled uh, medicine because the Dr. Walton site, you know, some of the phase two data that's already been shown that provide, you know, that demonstrated evidence of efficacy and safety. So those are the other things that we've been able to leverage very effectively. Okay. Yeah, Kiara. Well, I, Alexis and I think that Dave and uh, you also, you are representing the patient's voice within your company because that's your job. You are the patient relation guys. But our issue is not with you. And you, what you said, Alexi, represent exactly what I want. And I want the patient voice coming in much, much earlier from the preclinical phases that uh, Bill was talking about. And that's not happening in reality. And uh, that's not really happening because of my experience in the last years due to two rejections. One is from within internal company that the medical se section of the company does not understand the importance of incorporating the patient voice into the planning of the clinical trial and not just to review protocols and not just to, to uh, bring the material, the educational material for the patient, which is important by itself, but there's so much more, the, the difference between the perception of the doctors and the patients re regarding the side effects uh, severity and, and, and many more uh, topics which the patients can contribute. I know it's happening, I know it's happening very slowly and not in the pace that we want. And, and the other reason is also we have uh, been witnessing rejection from the uh, medical doctors who are in charge of the trials, doctors who are doing the scientists and researchers, in, at least in one case when I was involved, they said we don't want patients here in, in the steering committee. So it's a very sensitive triangle which is slowly, slowly trying to to open it, but it's a lot of work. And I think that my ultimate goal will be, in the future, we hope to reach a situation, not when pharma are coming to us today and asking, guys, we have a clinical trial which is not recruiting. Can you help us ex uh, put the, uh, the data about it to your patients and encourage them to come to the clinical trial? That's too late. We will not collaborate at that stage. Yeah. We plan in the future, hopefully it will happen, that trials that patients are not involved will not publish it. We'll publish only clinical trials and encourage patients to join, only trials where patients were involved in the planning. And hopefully we'll get to that day when I'm still here. Yeah, well, I was going to get into this later on, but what we're talking about here is patient centricity, patient uh, friendliness of trials. Uh, it's a term mentioned a lot when you're talking about clinical trial development. Uh, defined as the process of defining, of designing a trial around the patient. And every company and investigator uh, is going to say, and correctly from their perspective, that uh, they're conducting trials that are patient-centric, patient-friendly. Patients have a different view that you just mentioned. Um, and we all know that clinical trials are designed to answer specific sci scientific questions. These are science experiments. Uh, and that's a frustration for pa patients, from what I understand. Uh, they feel that trials should be more about the patients. Uh, can this be addressed? Uh, can they be more patient-centered? The other question is, should they be more patient-centered? Um, I, I mean, I'll just yeah. say, I, th I think one of the important players of, of that conversation is having the regulatory agencies yeah you know, comment on that as well, right. because sometimes our hands are tied in the sense of there are requirements um, that they want from us to gather in our studies. And and not not that they're not becoming more flexible, but it's, it's also moving very slowly. Um, and that's where I think the advocacy organizations can help as well, because when we do have a trial that we know that's not going to work because the standard it's being compared to isn't what is optimal for the patient, you know, to have another voice behind that. But sometimes we have to, as pharmaceutical companies, move forward with what the agencies have asked for before we can show them that that didn't work and it caused us some delays. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jim, did you want to say anything or add to Well, that? no, I mean, I think, you know, particularly in the heme malignancies where bone marrow biopsies are often required, right? And we know how painful and arduous is, that is for a patient, but Unfortunately, the agent, you know, like we just said, David said here, the agency requires that as part of, you know, part of the uh, you know, pre-examination and things like that. And so we know that that's not a pleasant experience for a patient to come in for regular bone marrow biopsies. But, you know, like I said, unfortunately, 
you know, it's not patient centric, but it's regulatory required centric. That's the yeah. that's and the challenge from the medical side. I think the the patient's voice in this process is is crucial. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd say Jora's points, are, I think, are excellent, and I think there, there's a couple opportunities, you know, as I've even interacted with some patients really trying to push this forward in the U.S. You know, one, which I think is key, is identification, I think, on the, on the advocacy group's end, you know, of individuals that really are well-suited to, to play that advocate role in, in those sort of discussions. Obviously, there's a lot of nuances about clinical trials, you know, and, and certainly there are many people, again, who are, you know, very sharp individuals that are, are well aligned to do this. They don't necessarily need to have a, a medical background, although that can be a plus. Uh, but again, people who have been uh, uh, attorneys or executives or other things that, that, you know, can bring a lot of perspective to that and others where just the complexity of the process can just be a, a bit overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's helpful saying, you know, boy, we recruited a few folks who, who again might really be well situated to to do this, uh, it, and others that you know it might just be such a knowledge gap to participate in that process that it may be overwhelming. Yeah. Dr. Ellis, thanks. I, I'd just like to make the point, to perhaps ring a bell. It, from my perspective, I, I think it, it, it's very important to consider the drug that we're studying. Mm -hmm. In other words, if if there's a drug that really appears in early phase research, even preclinical research, to be something that can modify a disease. If we take our example of, say, myelofibrosis, fibrosis, for example, um, then it becomes very important to do a study that's going to look at something very biological as an endpoint. Um, and that's perhaps still unpopular in terms of what's been discussed here in the last 10 minutes or so. Um, one would have to then very clearly define the, the pharma people, the clinical people with the patient voice involved, that this is going to be an, in quotes, unpleasant study because it's going to involve a lot of blood draws, bone marrows, and so forth. But that's something that potentially will change the course of the disease, as opposed to drugs which do not offer that hope, in which case clearly um, you know, patient benefit needs to be included in the study design without making it too arduous. All right. Dr. Bergdahl? Well, in general, when we are treating patients out, outside the clinical trial, we also perform a lot of various uh, analysis, various uh, follow-ups. It's not uh, regular like a clinical trial. It's a kind of uh, discussion between patient and the doctor, but we still do not need do need it. So in patients with polycythemia, with any problematic cytopenia or thrombocytopenia or something, we are performing bone marrow, sorry. It's necessary because we need, <laughs> it should have the impact. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in the moment, we do not have uh, some kind of replacement of some uh, technologies. On the other side, uh, I, I will completely agree with uh, Dr. Ellis that uh, in inclusion of patients from the beginning in some uh, crucial uh, drugs, uh, some drugs uh, which can modify the disease or can change the whole landscape uh, is very essential because those, pa uh, those patients involved, they are not looking only as uh, some kind of extra people. They are looking as the patients, how the protocol is correct, how the things are correct, how the things are even feasible. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, in the moment have a trial with the need to uh, have a blood drawing in the, la in the next uh, three months, three times a week. And they cannot recruit any patient outside the, the city when we have a trial because they cannot come. Right. And that's very, it is very frustrating. Luckily, it's very rare, it's a very, very rare disease. So I have three of two, two or three patients and they come every second day, but it's not a, com not, not a trial mm -hmm. which can be <laughs> easy for the patients. And the companies should have that in mind. But uh, also, they have a pressure by regulators. We have discussed things about uh, initial uh, involvement in that and initial involvement of the patients as well. Uh, I'm not sure that regulatory bodies who are not present here mm -hmm. are always welcoming uh, such, such a position. Mm -hmm. They have their demands. They have uh, predominantly safety as uh, the only the only, only major point First, yeah. uh, and only purpose of many trials. And they're only concerned about safety, not about clinical efficacy. You may have a drug which is not working, but it's very safe. Right. But uh, from that point, I'm not sure that the regulatory bodies, 
predominantly FDA in US, I'm not sure for EMEA, uh, will accept much influence of the patients, and that's uh, one of uh, pressures. Mm -hmm. uh, you as a society, we as a doctors, can uh, have the influence in that process. GCP is very high, very difficult to uh, harmonize and very difficult to change. We must say that we uh, are in that process for almost 30 years, and still we do not have the excellent regulations, but we still have regulations which are worldwide accepted. Right. And we have all trials all over the world which are the same. Mm -hmm. So the voice of the patient should be uh, in one of the processes. It depends on the organizing of the trials, of the people who are uh, creating trials. Those are doctors. These are not pharmaceutical companies, not uh, creating a trial. These are leaders in one field who are working with the people from pharma to create a trial. Mm -hmm. and those doctors can be influenced and can very reasonably assess and uh, understand the needs from the other side, like patients. Right. Does anybody in the audience want to? Yeah. A friend of mine in Germany where I live, she's a lady and she was a patient representative by, Mer by Merck and Pfizer. And she's retired now and she's running an advocacy group for women and medicine. It's, and she told me, I have to ask you, do you, uh, as a women in your studies for MPN, Martin Ellis told us yesterday it's about 60% are women by MPN patients. Yeah? And also Hiltrun told me, you ask, there are older people excluded in studies, but MPN patients are mostly about 60. And uh, how, do you, how do you handle it with MPN studies? for women and for old people. Well, there's, there's more than that, too. I, I was gonna, one of the questions I was thinking about was, how does geography, uh, social economic class, uh, gender, age, race, impact patient participation from, from both perspectives? Um, you know, can, can we actually look at that with a small patient population that we have? Hey, hey Bill, before we move yeah. on to that, can yeah. I just add one comment? Um, Go for it. To, to yeah. the patient centricity. I think the other thing too, we were talking about the trial itself and the design. I think, you know, we certainly have moved to a point where we're looking at what are endpoints or important things to measure in the study from a patient perspective with CROs. But I'm going to even take it back a step. I think there's something even bigger and it goes back to treating the participants as a human, right? As, mm -hmm. as a patient, as a person. And I think there's things that, you know, we're trying to implement and I, th I think you know, to fault, sometimes we get hung up into, okay, we got to enroll this many and, um, you know, into the process. But there are things that we can do to make the experience better for the patient as a whole. And small examples could be, you know, they, if they consent to be in a trial and they know they have to get blood work, you know, every week, you know, for the next six weeks, even providing a map to explain when they go on campus, it's building 55 and how to get to 55 mm -hmm. versus just giving the address so that it just becomes a more pleasant and easier experience um, for the patient. And I think we can do a better job of helping the investigators to sites and making that kind of standard so that the overall experience is, is more pleasurable because you know, patients are not only being diagnosed with a disease that's devastating to hear, but if they're considering a trial, that, that's scary, right? Mm -hmm, so sure. let's try to take away some of those other fears, the day-to-day, um, activities, you know, related to participating. Or make it as relatively easy as possible to participate, yeah, yeah. Dr. Mesa, you were gonna. So I think it's, it's clearly a key point. I think without question, you know, we want trials to represent the population of people that are affected, you know, and I think all those factors that, that you mentioned are, are relevant. And I think, I think there are barriers. Mm -hmm. They're really built into a protocol. So I, I would say it would be, uh, I've not seen in MPNs a trial that has an upper age limit as a cutoff. Mm -hmm. You know, so certainly cutting off people because of age, I think that largely has gone away in most cancer clinical trials and certainly in MPNs for, for, for many reasons. Now, having the trial be distributed amongst the people who the disease affects, you know, I'd say that there are some real gaps. Mm -hmm. One, Rare diseases tend to have trials that are more centered around academic centers and therefore tend to have a bias toward people of a higher socioeconomic uh, income. Uh, and I think that that's a big limitation in terms of all those social determinants of health without question. 
uh, two, there are, are cultural issues in terms of enrollment, you know, in terms of being sure that the materials and the information really uh, is, is, is helpful and appropriate. So in my area in Texas, we have patients of Hispanic origin and do the materials of the clinical trial as well as how we uh, address the cultural aspect of informed consent for the patient and their family, how does one adjust for that? Or many of you, again, have countries that are, are, are heterogeneous in terms of populations, how they are represented. I'd say in terms of the uh, clinical trials and MPNs, I'd say gender overall, at least it's been my impression, is fairly well balanced mm -hmm. uh, because of the, uh, the, the nature of the disease, the nature of the engagement and such. But I'd say socioeconomic has been the, the biggest limiter uh, in uh, many of those studies. What about, uh, go ahead, Dr. Sure, just, a, just a small comment um, in regards to your question. I think what, what you, we're talking about is a new kind of clinical trial uh, that, that's been in the literature recently called pragmatic clinical trials. And that's, I think, what as clinician investigators such as myself, that's what, that, and I'm sure Andrea as well, that's, that's what we're after in terms of people who are designing the studies. We want the study to be able to recruit almost everybody in our clinic, minimum possible uh, exclusion criteria. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to answer the scientific question best. It's going to encourage enrollment and it's going to spread the message. Uh, you know, more and more people in the community will be on clinical trials with these diseases in the, in the clinical community with you know, MPNs, for example. Yeah. Um, and that's another way of getting the message out. Yeah, one of the things that I came across when I was preparing for this was uh, focus groups. Um, I know that you, when you're divide, putting the trial together, you don't have a lot of time to conduct a focus group. Um, you have to enroll the patients in the focus group, you know, put them all, bring them all together. It's an expense, both time and money. Um, but if you ask patients what's holding them back from joining a trial, a focus group may tell you that uh, there's too many blood draws. If I wouldn't join that trial because I have to go every other day for a blood draw or the number of clinical visits is going to make me miss my work too often. So I won't be able to join that. Um, could a focus group be incorporated into a study design from both the pharmaceutical and the medical side? Well, I think, um, you know, Bill, you, you call it the focus group, but I think there are different ways of uh, achieving the same or similar results uh, by doing something else. And I think uh, what Novartis is doing, we are engaging patient advocacy experts and we have um, a tool, a platform, which we call a patient insights panel mm -hmm. that gives us an ability to address some of those questions early on and make sure that the trial is conducted and designed in a way that will make it easier for people to participate. Um, I think when it comes to participation, one important thing to think about is um, same way as a cancer diagnosis does not just affect the patient, one individual, it affects the family and more broadly the community. Mm -hmm. Same way participation in a clinical trial is not just a one-man show. So it's not just one patient taking half an hour out of his or her day to show up for an appointment. It's more than that because patients have families, they have kids, they have work, they have school, they have obligations, commitment. So this all needs to first uh, be kind of learned and acknowledged, right? So we need to understand what is the socio-demographic status of the uh, patient population that we're working with, and then to try to incorporate some of those support mechanisms in the clinical trial process in order to make mm -hmm. it easier and at the end more successful. Either it's recruiting process or more importantly, um, compliance and adherence to the study. All right. Anybody from the audience? If I may go back for a second for the exclusion criteria. Uh, we as patient organization, of course, we want the trial to be open for every patient. We don't want to exclude anyone. But on the other hand, we have to think about uh, that, uh, tr uh, for example, in MPNs where patients are older, for example, and they have uh, comorbidities and they have other diseases, uh, if you include everybody, and God forbid something happens to a patient on a trial and he dies, that can be, stop the trial even if it's not related to the drug mm -hmm. which was he, he was taking. So we as patient organization have also the responsibility to help this drug 
advance if it's going to be beneficial for the large group of patients and uh, be aware of that and not just press and say we want every patient to be included. So as a patient organization, we have to have a, a double responsibility, both to for the patients and also to understand what can be the consequences. And uh, I think that's what. Yeah. Anne, you had a question? Hi. So, you know, from the patient advocacy perspective, um, I'll try to make this very brief. It will be difficult, but I'll do the best I can. So we um, kind of developed this slide, and it's called the weird slide, you know, as to who participates in a clinical trial. And we discovered about three years ago we put this together because we were asking questions um, from patients. And what we surmised or what, we, what happened was um, we call it the weird slide. So it's, it's white, educated, insured, mostly retired, and in the United States it was Democrats, believe it or not. It's probably not that way anymore. Um, much to my, well, anyway. So, so some of the things that I would just like to impart to this wise group of gentlemen is, um, you know, I think we would have more, it would be more inclusive um, if there were some things in place to support all patients to get to these trials. And just what Bill said, you know, some of the issues are um, people don't want to tell the people at work that they have a blood cancer or a chronic blood cancer, um, fear of, you know, the financial issues surrounding participation, fear of, um, as Ruben suggested, you know, there are some biases behind being involved in a clinical trial from different ethnic groups that may not have had a great experience in the past. Um, you know, we are here. The one thing I will say, however, is on our website, in our newsletters, the updated information on clinical trials is, it has many times the greatest hits. And so there is interest. We, we get calls from patients that say, I want to participate. What's happening? Sometimes we aren't informed about some clinical trials that are going on and I'm, I'm just shocked that, you know, we have not been notified by some of our constituents. Um, we do try to reach out to them, of course, and stay in close touch. But there are, there are deep layers of issues surrounding um, participation, particularly in clinical trials. I love the idea of patient-centric um, information. And some groups, some organizations do better, are better at this than others, but we all need to be actively seeking, you know, a solution to this. Yeah, I'll, can I, can I just I'm just going to pipe in real quickly uh, uh, an advertisement for the European <laughs> Research Foundation. Our uh, clinical trial page is also one of the most vibrant pages on our website. It gets probably more hits than any of the others except for the specific disease information which patients are struggling for after they've left their doctor in a fog about uh, what polycythemia vera in this case might mean. But, yeah, the clinical trial page is important, but we also have that problem of keeping it updated with uh, has it moved from a phase two to a phase three? Is this trial still enrolling? Is it uh, increased the number of uh, locations? Uh, that sort of thing. So it's, it's, it's a challenge from our side of it, too. Yeah. And actually, I'd like to ask you a question, maybe, and Bill, to your point about, you know, weird. I thought that was very interesting. I love the acronym. But uh, I'm curious, in terms of the people that are going to your website, is it synonymous or, or, you know, analogous to the weird, right? So, are, so it is, you see a much difference in terms of socioeconomics, yes. race, all that. So that's, and that's the interesting thing. And, and so I guess, you know, my question to the physician and, and Ruben, and so where are these, you know, because we said before, you know, the academic centers where most of the trials are being done, and because of that, right, you get this skewed bias. Where are these patients then uh, who have the, lower socioeconomic differences or even the race, who are managing these patients and can they get referred to the academic centers? Is there, is there a barrier for that? So I'd say that there are some major differences between the practices in the U.S. and many of the countries represented here. You know, in the United States, the general practice of hematology is primarily by medical oncologists who also do hematology. You know, and their engagement with MPNs tends to be more modest. You know, whereas here in Europe and many other countries, they tend to be people who only do hematology and then do hematology 
laboratory work as the complement, you know, uh, to that. And so I do find that the that the general level in other countries sometimes is better uh, because there's there's just a greater link to the the hematology piece. I I will make. Uh, to, to just a, a comment regarding the, this discussion in terms of potential opportunity, you know, in terms of, of your organizations and, and overall. I mean, I do think it would be a worthwhile discussion between you guys as groups to say, okay, well, what is, what is our goal in terms of trying to advance this further? You know, one goal might be to try to have engagement with, let's say, the MPN phase three clinical trials as a starting place. Mm -hmm. So the largest studies, because there's a river of phase two studies I, and although you might get to that point someday, that, that's ambitious. But the phase three is a more manageable number. So one could have, uh, again, potentially a, uh, the feasibility of patient engagement, I think, is a key opportunity there as well. Because, again, even if any of these gentlemen or companies wanted to engage that, trying to start that from scratch is very difficult. Sure. But if you were to say there, there is a, a pool of individuals that, I mean, there's many around the room here that I, I would welcome input on any trial because they're very sharp individuals that are very well read in on these issues. But you had a group of you know, 12, 14, 16, what have you, that could review a protocol virtually, give feedback in a reasonable amount of time. But then perhaps one of that group could then remain as a liaison specifically to that trial and then kind of shepherd that part forward and then kind of distribute that. Because again, we're not talking hundreds of, of phase three trials. It's a, it's a manageable number. You'd have people who were played uh, an early role in terms of the, the trial concept. Uh, and then there could be kind of a liaison to a more central uh, advocacy piece. Uh, and then depending upon which countries are represented in that study might be able to link with the appropriate advocacy groups. Yeah, go ahead, doctor. I have comment, uh, a comment uh, on those who are t treating patients. Well, I'm living in a country where uh, we have very strong social security health insurance. Uh, it's like a United Kingdom uh, health insurance system, NHS. So uh, patients are treated according to their diseases from the regional level to university levels. We have divided country in four uh, areas uh, according to referral institutions, and the patients cannot skip uh, their referral institution to a certain extent if they want to go to another one. But uh, that uh, allows us to talk with colleagues on the same level for that. And we have a uh, hematology, as Ruben said, as an independent specialty. So even our hematologists in the countryside, in the smaller hospitals, know quite well what is doing. We are performing uh, some kind of education, some of those uh, things. They are calling us uh, by the phone. Well, we are, the, we, are, we are very similar to Israel. We have 100 hematologists in whole Serbia. Yeah. So it's very easy to have the patient and the social economic uh, level uh, have the only role in the case of the patients who are uh, very dependable and without families. Do not forget in countries in Eastern Europe and in Balkans, most of families nowadays are very old because their kids are in states in Western Europe. Yeah. So they, are, uh, they uh, need some kind of support. Those patients are not enrolling in the trial because their private reasons are much higher. And uh, Bob said it's, uh, it's a kind of a family. They do not have a family, but they are not able to participate in the trial because they should, ca should come, etc. Even in the uh, easiest trial, let's say, with two or three visits or one visit a month. Right. That's a point. Uh, participation in the trial demands uh, that patient is very committed to that. We cannot provide uh, trials to patients who are not committed, who are not interested in trials, but they are interested in the treatment. Yeah. They do not like to write some kind of notes to report us what they have as uh, side effects or something. Unfortunately, we as a doctors are not able to participate with those uh, subjects who are not, uh, who are, can be ordinary patients, but unfortunately they are not common. Probably is this the reason why we have the patients in retirement, patients with, with higher education. They are, uh, they are willing to participate in that. That's the that's point. Go ahead. Uh, I think that you describe a situation where a physician uh, offers uh, a patient to join the trial or some kind of a trial. But most of the times uh, it's the other way around. A patient wishes to join uh, a trial, but he doesn't know that it exists because the drug company does not release the information yet. And 
uh, Giora can uh, tell you that we tried uh, to uh, gather some information about uh, ongoing uh, current trials, and it is very hard, uh, hard for us to get that information. And uh, how can we promote, uh, uh, promote it uh, if we cannot get the information from the drug companies or the uh, doctors? Go ahead, do you mind? Um, that's a great question. And um, I know this problem exists. It's, I don't know how widespread it is that sometimes the companies cannot release certain information. Obviously, all the trials that are um, in the public domain, we can share information about, so that's not an issue. I think you're asking about some specific example, which I may not be aware of. Uh, but uh, as a way of sharing a best practice from, in fact, um, our colleagues at the CML Advocates Network, what they do, and I don't know if it's actually somebody sends it or it's automated, but we do receive this uh, email asking us to provide an update on ABCD trials and a few other questions, and we receive it on a regular basis. I think it's every other month, maybe. And uh, that's actually a fantastic way for us to get this information in one place, send it to the CML Advocates Network, and for the advocates then to share this information with all of the member organizations that they're working with. Right, so, and um, just have a quick quick comment on the um, patient engagement and, and working with the pool of experts. I think there is a, a great opportunity there for, for um, those patient experts to actually be elevated and become professional advocates, right? Because, you know, we talk a lot about let's, let's just involve patients in a clinical trial. Let's just, you know, call on a random patient and get them um, review the protocol. Well, I don't think it's going to work. I think people do need to have uh, an ability to speak the same language with the uh, uh, steering committee members, with the medical, uh, with the investigators, with, with people who uh, design those studies uh, on the pharma side as well. So I think the ideas are out there. I think there are fantastic examples in Europe how it may work. Um, I think there are opportunities to do more in the form of a training or um, capacity building exercises just for that. So then we can have that, that pool of experts that we can actually tap into and call at any time saying, would you be willing to join the phase three clinical trial and help us review ABCD and stay, stay involved and invested for a long term? Okay, we're, we're getting close to the end here. Right, but that UPIT is, is not, doesn't cover everything, unfortunately. And, and, you know, we have, like, advocates, like the ones that are in the room are very far and few in between. It's not every advocate is like that. Yeah, we're getting close to the end here. Go ahead. Yes, I have a question because um, sometimes happened in Chile that some physicians they they don't know about some trials. They have some there's some patients in some trials, but half of the patients they know about that, half of the patients don't know, and the same with the physicians. So, in your um, in your I have said, um, experience, um, how is the best way or which one have to inform about the tr trials, like physicians, maybe the laboratories, like the organi patients' uh, organizations, because not everybody um, have the information. So I don't know which one have to inform, because not everybody uh, can participate. So maybe some physicians, they don't want to give the information. Sometimes they don't have, so I don't know which one is the, like, it, how to do that, you know, mm -hmm. or how to inform. Well, I think that it would very much depend on how things are set up in your particular country. Um, the way we do it is um, through our, in the MPN example, the MPN working group um, has a you know, mailing list of all the, all the physicians who are members. Um, and if we get information about a new trial that's opening up in our country in you know, whichever centers, uh, we distribute that among all the members of the working group. And we, um, in parallel, will distribute it to all the hematology departments. Again, it's a small country, relatively uh, easy to target these, uh, these departments. So we try and get everyone who potentially could be involved. Our hematology association has a website. We post it on the website. Um, and that's the way we get the message out uh, to as many of the physicians as possible. Working 
on the other side of it as well, we have um, advocacy members who are part of our working group, so they get the same information, and presumably then they distribute it to, to their members. But again, that begs the question of which of the patients are going to be uh, you know, uh, accessing that information. It's going to be the weird patients. <laughs> well, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, go ahead, Giora. Ten minutes. No, I, got I wanted to challenge the pharma company people here and that's about the location of your clinical trial. We know that most clinical trials are held in developed countries, US and uh, Europe uh, mainly. Very, very few go to South America, to Asia, and uh, Africa almost, I think, none. Huh? And East Europe, uh, sorry. And East Europe, very, very few go to former East, Eastern Europe. And uh, I know that the pharma is using the excuse that there is not enough experience, centers of excellence are lacking, uh, monitoring uh, div uh, is not uh, developed enough, but that's a huge area which is the majority of the world where the patients are living. And actually excluding them from clinical trials, it's excluding them from sometimes from opportunity to save their life with a new drug. So I think the part of the responsibility of the pharma company will be also to help and develop centers of excellence in these regions and improve the monitoring. And this is, I think, part of the us, also the responsibility of us as a community of patient advocates to exert the patient on you, on the, on the pharma, when you decide when, where to open a trial, is to convince you and make sure that you also expand it, not only to you open the USA. Yeah, the last question uh, for both sides and the patients, if we have enough time, um, from the pharma side. If you had one message for the representatives here today, um, what do you want people to take away as far as uh, the patients to hear about clinical trials, and what do you want to get to them? The one thing. You want me to go? Go for it. Uh, I mean, from my perspective, it's, it's awareness. Mm -hmm. Right, awareness with education, understanding what they are, and being aware that that they exist, and that they should speak to their doctor about them. Um, I think what we talked a little bit about today is getting down more into the community and to the populations that maybe aren't aware. Mm -hmm. Totally agree with Dave about the awareness message, and I also think what I would like you to know that. The companies, Novartis, are really interested in working with you in clinical trial setting, right? It's not an easy um, kind of black and white type of setting when we have all of the answers and all of the solutions right away, but that's where the work comes in. And it's not just our work or your work or regulatory agencies' work or medical experts' work. This is a true collaboration. And this is why I think organizations like Global Coalitions exist. And I think that might be one of the challenges that the organizations and the broader coalitions may take. So uh, that, that would be my wish to continue this dialogue and work together. Jim, I'm reading your bi body language here. <laughs> <laughs> I just got weird body language. <laughs> so yeah, in addition to what my colleague says as well, I mean, the thing that uh, I wanted to leave you with as well is, you know, drug development is the lifeline obviously to everybody here and we get that, but also, particularly in oncology, right, it is so high risk. And for particularly a little company like CTI where we don't have revenue coming in, it is extremely high risk, right? Mm -hmm. And one stat I just want to give you is that, you know, only 4% of oncology trials are 4% you know, of oncology assets or drugs actually make it to the market. Mm -hmm. And so it's high risk. But the point of everybody's comments here today about involving patients, right, you know, physicians and obviously pharma, is critical to increase that success, mm -hmm. right? But the challenge, obviously, is the regulatory bodies. The, the reason why drugs aren't successful in terms of development sometimes is because of the you know, restrictions and requirements by the regulatory agency that they put in place that you know, this is the bar to achieve what they call success. So you know, that's my plea to you, but also my plea that that's why we need to work together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mesa, from the uh Doctor's perspective, what message do you want MPN patients to hear about clinical trials? Well, I would say really the importance of clinical trials 
in terms of both care and really moving the field forward. You know, I'm mindful of the cultural piece that uh, amongst children's cancers, where there have been really tremendous advances, about 90% of children in the U.S. go on to a clinical trial for their disease. And the clinical trials have become the standard of care. Now, they're highly scrutinized, they're highly, highly regulated, but with that, there have been uh, unbelievable advances in the pediatric cancers. You know, in adults, that's well less than 10%, and it's usually less than 5% mm -hmm. of individuals go on, on clinical trials. You know, so viewing that as an important part of the options, you know, is really key. And in large part, these studies are highly scrutinized and regulated so that regardless of what arm you go on to a clinical trial, you know, at a minimum, it should be a standard of care level in terms of therapy or better. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think it's just an important option. It's clearly always a choice, but I think, you know, too few people really probably make that choice. Uh, and I think there's parts of it that are, are logistics, part of it are hassle, but part of it is, again, a, a lack of, I think, of enough kind of impetus behind them that it's that it's important both for them and for others that face the, the disease. Right. Dr. Ellis? I think I'd like patients to realize that when they go on a clinical trial, they're going to be getting outstanding clinical care and that their doctor is heavily invested in the success of the trial and the success of the agent um, for their personal well-being in addition to moving the field forward uh, and would try and discourage this, the view of the, uh, the guinea pig model of participants in a clinical trial. Dr. Bogdanovich, what about the Eastern European perspective? Well, I would like to say to all patients in the world, don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to find information. There is an internet, large, big vampire called Google. They can find many things. Don't be afraid to participate in a clinical trial. Uh, why? In many instances, in a clinical trial, patients can have a different treatment from that which is uh, obvious or recommended by some regulations, recommendations or registration. On the other side, in the clinical trials, most of patients can have a, let's say, better uh, follow-up, uh, better care. It's not better care than a comparison that someone will not be cared, but uh, there is an extra information, there are extra, um, uh, extra following up, extra blood tests or something. It's because of security, but also it provides information to us doctors how the dead thing will work in a real clinical practice after the clinical trial. And we are getting experience through the clinical trial that some drug is very safe or a safety profile or what we expect is very good. And I have a comment for pharma industry. Open, leave the bar. World is not US. Mm -hmm. Right. There are a lot of many countries with a good profile doctors, with a good uh, experience. And in many cases, when we are open at the bar and we are open to countries, you, can, you have found someone who is a really uh, trialist, a person who can lead a trial. Unfortunately, we do not have the num enormous amount of doctors who can lead a trial. That's a point. But we can provide, to a certain extent, a uh, large income, a uh, large uh, influx in the, those uh, clinical trials. In some trials, we are the second or the third recruiters, in especially in cases we do not have uh, similar drugs or we have uh, no access to the drugs at all. Uh, last focus, is there a patient perspective that they want the panel to? Go ahead. Um, well, uh, absolutely, as the only representative of the Philippines here, especially uh, my father having been diagnosed with essential thrombocytemia shortly after diagnosis, the only drug available for treating that hydroxyurea has not been available in the country for over a year. And we actually have to order it through India <laughs> in order to get it. Um, and we do have those centers of excellence. University of the Philippines is our Harvard of Asia. And you know, in, we have those centers and we are willing to collaborate and we have patients who are waiting. I, I've even received an email from a pregnant woman who di recently diagnosed with ET trying to get on something where she can knowingly protect her, her pregnancy while being on a medication that could treat her ET. So uh, you know, we, we are here and we're excited and we're, we're prepared uh, to partner, I guess is what I just wanted to say. Well, I'd like to thank the, uh, the panel. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, present this. Uh, did somebody else have a question? Or? Yeah, way in the back. 
it's um, it's not so much a question. It's I want to share this this practice or good this example with you. Uh, that exactly because uh, we also in the HIV field have this issue of um, an unequal distribution of clinical trials across the world. So we have put together with the help of community members in Russia and in Central Asia, we have put together a list of possible potential clinical trial centers and doctors. And this list is publicly available to all companies who want to go into this region. Uh, these uh, these centers exist. These are good doctors. They can they can conduct clinical trials. They know what's going on. You have to speak Russian in order to access these people. These people are not stupid, but they speak Russian. So get your act together. That's a language, and it's it's. I mean, it's not a major issue. It's another language. And then you can go and, and you will find the trial populations that are depleted in other parts of the world. That's, that's, that's simple. And it's, I mean, so you can do that on, your, on, on, on the level of your own communities. You can also just look around the world and write this list up and maintain the list as we did for, for HIV and, and viral hepatitis. And so we can show to the companies that no, no, no. I mean, if you if you need uh, long-term survivors uh, uh, or women, middle-aged women living with HIV treatment naive, you will no longer find them in Los Angeles or in Madrid or in Frankfurt or London because they are not there anymore. They are in Russia and they are in the Ukraine and they are in Kazakhstan. Go there. And here's the list where you can go. Pretty simple. Thank you. I appreciate the time, and uh, I believe our time is up. Thank you.